Thank you very much. And um, I would like to express also my uh, thanks to the organizers for a very unique opportunity to be in a workshop in the same place with mathematicians. And um, I've been quite diligently attending the sessions. And I must say, I learned quite a few things. So hopefully, my talk will be interesting too. And um, it will give, of course, very different perspective, a little bit more engineering perspective. So today, we are going to talk about uh, the applications of microwave imaging with a focus on very particular type of Im imaging reconstruction methods, uh, real-time methods. These are the methods that are uh, supposed to provide uh, an image um, by the time the measurements are done. In other words, without delay. So, um, of course, the applications of microwave uh, imaging, particularly near field imaging, uh, are interesting because microwaves penetrate well into optically uh, obscured or opaque media, such as clothing and walls and luggage and living tissue and um, soil and whatnot. And uh, that is why applications are now being considered in the frequency bands all the way from half a gigahertz into the millimeter wave bands, uh, terahertz uh, region. But uh, strictly speaking, microwave imaging is considered the, is considering applications from around half a gigahertz to 300 uh, gigahertz. The lower the frequency is, the better the penetration in most of the materials of interest. And that is because most of these materials contain water, which is um, uh, causing a lot of uh, loss and therefore, we prefer to use lower frequencies when we work with, for example, ground penetration or tissue penetration, uh, although, of course, we have to sacrifice some uh, resolution. So um, the uh, advances and the recent uh, quick growth in microwave near field applications is driven also not only by need, but also by the available of uh, technology. In the last 10 to 15 years, a remarkable miniaturization happened in the radar and radio electronics. Nowadays, especially in the low gigahertz range, we can buy radios that are on chip uh, of surface areas of around one to two square millimeters, which enables us to put a radio on each antenna which enables us in turns to design large active antenna arrays. In other words, these are sensors that contain not only the antennas, but also the radios in them, or the radars, depending on what you're imaging. And by now, we have a diverse suite of imaging uh, reconstruction methods. Um, and the applications are indeed diverse. Um, whole body scanners are very well known. Um, and this is, these are security applications for scanning for concealed weapons on body. Non-destructive testing, of course, through the wall imaging, uh, probably one of the more fascinating applications, medical imaging and underground radar. Some of those already entering the uh, commercial world. So um, in order to demonstrate what is expected of real-time microwave imaging, I'm going to use a video that one of the most uh, prominent microwave imaging teams in the world has shared on YouTube. Um, of course, the results are also available in a transactions paper. And essentially what they have uh, made is an ultra wide band microwave camera working in the frequency range from 20 to 30 gigahertz for the real time imaging of objects in the extreme near field of the antennas. What you see here is the camera itself positioned over a computer bag that in one compartment has a box cutter, in another compartment has scissors, um, and um, the system performs 2D imaging, but it can focus at different depths, and therefore it, um, for all practical purposes, can perform 3D imaging by 3D rendering from sliced images. So uh, you can observe that indeed the images are generated real time. This is an electronically switched system with a large number of open end waveguides. You are going to see it right here. They call it the ultra wide band camera. And um, each of that, uh, each of these antennas has its own radio receiver. As you can see, this is the raw data as the person moves its hands right on top of these antennas. You can see the synthetic, um, synthetic aperture image appearing here. 
Here you see how they adjust the focus to different depths in order to get the best resolution. And uh, at uh, 30 frames per second, this is really uh, 3D imaging. Anyway, it is, uh, you can certainly access the video on YouTube, but this is what is expected of a real-time microwave imaging system. So another application that is already, it has entered the commercial world, is um, the uh, whole body millimeter wave imagers. And this work was pioneered by the engineers in the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. At the end of the last century, they reported the first scans that some of them you see here with enhanced imaging algorithms shown in 2010, which use microwave holography, one of the most successful so far real-time imaging method. And you see that on a mannequin, they have successfully imaged with very good resolution, a gun on the leg, a knife on the other one, a water bottle at the waist. At the back, you see a utility vest filled with all sorts of little things. And they have also shown that using um, polarimetric scans, this is measuring copole and cross-pole return from the target, they can actually obtain similarly high-quality images even in the low, lower gigahertz range between 10 and 20 gigahertz. So um, probably more uh, fascinating and uh, to, at least to me application is that in tissue imaging and uh, we are particularly interested to see what is happening in breast uh, cancer scanning, uh, uh, sorry, screening applications and um, there are quite a few prototypes already uh, reported under clinical studies in the literature, but um, I'm showing here, to my knowledge, the last one, and this is of Professor Kikawa in Hiroshima University. And uh, what you see here is a hemispherical cup that accommodates 16 uh, electronically switched um, slot antennas. Uh, eight are transmitting and eight are receiving. At every measurement, one antenna transmits, all others receive. In addition to that, the uh, system allows for rotation to collect more data, as uh, the number of responses is particularly critical for the delay and sum algorithm, real-time radar imaging algorithm that they're using. Uh, the more responses you have, the better off you are with this particular correlation-based method. I'm going to briefly describe it, hopefully, if I have time. And you can see that they have uh, fairly successfully found the tumor in, uh, this is in the uh, transverse plane and the sagittal plane. Here you see a CT scan. And the tumor is fairly large, so this is not a very um, challenging imaging scenario, but um, the accuracy of and the, the quality of the image is quite impressive in this work. And uh, let me just mention that um, in the last five or six years, we have seen really an explosion of commercial applications of near field real time microwave imaging. Of course, in addition to the whole body scanners, the millimeter wave uh, technology, we also now are seeing through the wall and through the floor devices, such as the one shown here, made by a company in Israel, which uses ultra-wide band frequencies, three to eight gigahertz, where with a handheld device that even snaps to your cell phone, you can uh, discover things like pipes and uh, studs behind drywalls, and uh, even under cement floors, certainly under wooden floors. Of course, underground radar has been available now in the commercial world for the last 15 years or so, and they can image pipes infrastructure uh, as in the ground, as deep as uh, one meter. So um, how does microwave near field imaging work and what are the challenges that we still need to overcome? I'm going to skip um, over the data acquisition part, which is a little bit more relevant to engineers. In this part, I usually describe uh, what are the design requirements for an acquisition system. 
um, what sampling you need, how often do you need to sample, on what patterns do you need to sample, what, what surfaces do you need to use, how do you sample in frequency or in time, which one would be better for your application, but these are really engineering details that I think would not be that interesting for this community. So I'm going to focus on the forward models that we use and the inversion strategies that are employed for real-time imaging. And of course, I'm going to try and show examples and compare and contrast methods. So let us first start with the forward models. And uh, depending on what you measure, with frequency sweep measurements, you should be aware that microwave engineers use um, almost overwhelmingly only vector network analyzers, which essentially provide S-parameter data. These are frequency-dependent data. Essentially, an S-parameter is nothing more than a, a transmission or reflection coefficient. Think of it as a reflection or transmission voltage coefficient that where the voltage is measured on a 50-ohm load. And there you go. That is what uh, the S-parameter means with the index I, the first index indicating the receiver, and the index K indicating the transmitter. And this is illustrated here where the transmitting kth port is connected to a transmitting antenna and the ith port is connected to the receiving antenna and the scattering is occurring at the object under test, which is inside the region of interest Vs for scatter. So um, not long ago, actually, not that long ago, uh, we have developed at McMaster the um, uh, quantitatively accurate forward model for scattering parameters. Um, and the constants in front of the integral are known. I'm not going to explain what is what. Point is, you know these constants. What is inside the integral for an isotropic penetrable or dielectric object is the unknown contrast, which is the subject of our investigation. This is what we image. And the complex permittivity contrast is simply the difference of the complex permittivity of the object minus that of the background. The Green's function, we have proven to be the incident field distribution inside the region of interest, which is generated by the receiving antenna when this antenna operates in a transmitting mode. So this is um, an incident field, which implies that this is the field distribution obtained in the region of interest in the absence of the object under test. And of course, we also need the total internal field, which is the field generated by the transmitting antenna in the region of interest in the presence of the object under test. And this is where the total name comes from, total field, including scattered and incident field portions. Okay, so um, in order to arrive at a fast solution in real time, we do linearize this model. And all of you here are familiar with the Born approximation. The Born approximation has its, um, has its limitations. Uh, however, it converts an intrinsically nonlinear problem into a linear one. And it is intrinsically nonlinear because the total internal field is an implicit function of the unknown contrast. And that function is analytically practically intractable because it comes through Maxwell's equations. So Born's approximation comes very handy. And uh, under the conditions of weak scattering, we can replace the total field with the incident field, which of course has nothing to do with the object under test. And therefore, it is assumed to be a known distribution. Now, um, aside from the fact that Born's uh, approximation comes with serious limitations on what your object under test could be in terms of size and permittivity. What we really worry in near field imaging is that even these incident fields from which we obtain our what we call the resolvent kernel of the linearized problem, uh, this, in order to know this kernel, I need to know these incident fields. And you may think that is a simple problem, but that is not a simple problem in near field imaging. That is because the incident field distributions in the antenna's near zone are quite difficult to model. And I have borrowed this diagram from, from a nice web page on Wikipedia, which shows 
how in the near zone of the antenna, the fields become much more complex, much more rapidly varying in space than the fields in the far zone, which are nice and can even be described analytically by this very simple spherical function, which is multiplied by the known gain of the antenna, the radiation pattern, and by the known polarization vector of the antenna. However, such an expression is not valid in the near zone, and this is our trouble. So when do we know that we work in the near zone? There are very well-known criteria, three criteria related to the size of the antenna, the wavelength, and the size of the scatter. If one of these three conditions is there, you are dealing with near zone imaging, and you are having trouble with your kernel. Anyway, so let us look briefly into time domain. In the time domain, the, the model is very similar, of course. The only difference between the reflection transmission coefficients in time is that they are functions of time. And instead of integral only in time, we have a convolutional integral in, uh, only in space. We have also convolution in time, which is a fourth integration in time. But again, uh, contrast. Again, born linearized kernel, that is what is used in radar imaging. And again, the um, Green's function, uh, by the way, this is a scalar model of scattering, but that is what is typically used in uh, pulsed radar imaging. So again, your Green's function is the impulse response, the field, in time and space of the receiving antenna, if this antenna were to transmit in the absence of the object under test, same concepts. And the total field, it is differentiated in time here. That is what this prime prime means over there, right here. So uh, the linearization quality of the Born approximation can be used there as well. In addition to the approximation in microwave imaging, which is needed to linearize the kernel, we are doing one more approximation, and typically this is not discussed well in the literature. Uh, we, never, we unfortunately cannot measure directly scattering portion of the S parameter. We can measure the S parameters in the presence of the object under test. This is the total field S parameter. And we can measure the S parameter in the absence of the object under test, and this is the incident field S parameter. We cannot measure the scattered field S parameter. And therefore, you have to make some approximations on how to extract the scattering portion of a measurement. Under the Born expansion of a scattered field, which is a simple superposition to the first order, a simple superposition of incident and scattered field, I can simply subtract the incident field from the, date, from the total field. However, there is another approximation which has been used in medical imaging extensively, and that is the Ritov approximation of the data. So on the left-hand side, where your data sets, you can actually, you have a choice. And a lot of papers have been written on which one is better, Born or Ritov. You know, I can tell you that this is not a problem. They, they perform very similarly, except that Ritov is quite sensitive to abrupt changes in your magnitude or phase. But the right-hand side is the same. And what is really important is the right-hand side because the right-hand side is where the limitation of the Born approximation for the total internal field is far more severe, it is stated here, compared to the limitations associated with the data Born and Ritov approximation. And what the mathematical literature typically gives us comparison for is the data side of the approximation. But that is not what is detrimental here. It is the kernel. Never mind. If our object under test violates the Born limitations, which essentially are associated with the size of the scatter, A is the radius of the smallest sphere circumscribing your scatter, and KS and KB are the wave numbers of the scatter and the background, respectively. What if your object under test violates those approximations? which very often, especially in tissue imaging and even concealed weapon detection imaging is exactly the case, 
Are we going to give up and not measure? No. Don't worry. Scott actually the other day said, don't worry too much about the Born approximation because we know what the effect will be. If your object under test violates this approximation, what you will see in your images instead of contrast, you will see differences between incident and total field. And what are the differences between incident and total field in strong scattering? Multiple scattering and mutual coupling. Let me show you the effects in these images uh, of the fact that holography works on linearized kernel. Do you see this shadow here or this, this bright spot here? That's air. That's, there's nothing there. This is exactly multiple scattering occurring between the body and the arm. You see this bright spot between the legs? That's what it is. It is an artifact because of your linearized kernel. So these are things that actually the trained eye of a person can tell in an image. So we don't worry that badly about the Born approximation. Now let me uh, continue with uh, the uh, real-time inversion method. So that is the forward models that we use, how he, what sort of approximations are there. Now with, I'm going to focus, of course, only on uh, real-time imaging that are the engines of all these applications. So essentially, uh, to contrast and compare with nonlinear inversion methods that sometimes I refer to as inverse scattering methods, well, I, I kind of find this um, wording not quite right because we, with direct or linear inversion, we also are solving an inverse scattering problem. The basic mathematical difference is that in the first case, you are solving a linearized problem, and that is why these are linear inversion methods. And um, in, the, um, in the other case, you're solving a nonlinear uh, problem, and therefore they should be called nonlinear inversion methods. Never mind that terminology. In nonlinear inversion, you do not approximate the total internal field. You end up with an additional unknown distribution, that is the distribution of the total field, and therefore you need to bring in an additional set of equations. You have more unknowns, you need more equations. So strictly speaking, you bring in Maxwell's equations. And this is not done in the linear equation solver, and that is why it is fast. Well, on a very superficial level. Anyway, so here we are at holography, one of the most successful, as I said, uh, real-time microwave imaging methods, which is at the heart of all uh, millimeter wave imagers that are currently deployed in most airports around the world, major airports. So holography refers to, to a group of reconstruction methods that use both magnitude and phase of the scattered waves recorded at the surface to produce a 3D image in a single inversion step. And here an illustration of a measurement setup is shown where scanning is performed on two planes. It does not have to be two. This is just an example. What I want to emphasize here is that every scan position, X and Y in this case, you can obtain quite a few responses to work with. You can obtain reflection coefficients, transmission coefficients. If the system is linear, then S12 equals S21. Nonetheless, additional information. You can throw in cross-pole measurement. So you can now have 16 responses at one position in space. And in addition, if you want to do 3D imaging, you do need to add one more dimension to your data. So far, you have spatial and polarization information. But for 3D imaging, you need to add either frequency or time if you want to do a third dimension in your image. You want 3D image, you need three-dimensional data. Otherwise, it just is not going to work, not in real time. So here, let us look how holography resolves a problem where you have hundreds of thousands of voxels within two to three seconds. So the first thing that we have to uh, observe is that holography makes an assumption that the background medium is either uniform or layered in planar scanning which is done anyway in most imaging methods. If that is the case, then your kernel is translationally invariant 
in the lateral directions x and y, which are also the directions of scanning as is illustrated here. What does this mean? This means that if you know the kernel of your equation for antennas positioned at the center of the acquisition surface, you know this kernel for any other position of your antennas simply by doing coordinate shift, you can obtain that kernel. Of course, the, it is very easy to understand if you know the field distribution of the antennas at a given position in a uniform space, if you need the antennas, the field moves with the antennas. It is that simple. So when you substitute back in your forward model, now you start looking at something that starts to look very, very similar to convolution in X and Y between the unknown contrast and your kernel. It's not a convolution yet. But before I go and explain how it becomes a convolution, let me give you an example so that you can appreciate what is the physics behind all that. Um, in far zone imaging, we use analytical kernels to image. In other words, these kernels are analytical functions of space. And for example, in the whole body scanners, what they use is this, they use monostatic radar, so transmitting and receiving antenna coincide, and therefore these two fields are identical in the kernel. And this is what they use. This, it is as simple as this plane wave representation, uh, locally plane wave representation of the kernel, and it works. In the near zone, this in the Fresnel zone measurements, you better throw in the uh, impact of the uh, spread of the amplitude, or rather power spread in space uh, in a cylindrical measurement system that you have a symmetry with respect to an axis, you may want to use Hankel functions. But these are far field analytical kernels. They don't work in the near zone. And in my team, we initially started playing with simulating those fields which we can do for the known antennas in the near zone, and then take the dot product to form the kernel. But we found out very quickly, especially in tissue experiments, that even that doesn't work very well because of very severe modeling errors in the simulations. And that is why we decided to look into estimating near field kernels from measurements of the point spread function, and that works. I can tell you from personal experience that this works best. And it is faster. I will tell you later, we needed two weeks in order to simulate the field distributions of antenna array in order to only find out that the images are garbage. The same kernel was obtained for half an hour with a mechanical scanner and the images appeared. So measuring the PSF in the, in the uh, is the best thing to do in near zone imaging. Of course, po point spread function is the response of the system measured with a very small scatter, typically positioned at the center of the volume of interest as is illustrated here. And using reciprocity, it is really very simple to show that if you have the point spread function uh, PSF nod, which means point spread function for the scattering probe at the center of the image to volume, it is exactly equal to your kernel uh, when the kernel is acquired with the antennas at the center of the apertures, the acquisition uh, apertures, only for a flip in sign. So in the um, lateral direction. So when you substitute this in your forward model, the kernel with the PSF, now you're looking at a convolution. And that is why it is important to ensure that your background medium in holography is uniform, especially when you're measuring, for example, uh, layered structures or tissue structures. That is because the background medium. That is because you have this assumption which allows you to exploit 2D convolution. Of course, if you apply now the Fourier space, the, the Fourier transform to both sides of your equations, you end up with an equation in Fourier space at each point in Fourier space. Now we, we replaced essentially two integrals with a multiplication. And that is a system of equations which you can obtain by discretizing this integral along z into a sum, 
and you are now looking at a very simple linear equation in the unknown uh, contrast, this time in Fourier space, written at one point in Fourier space. I can write actually quite a few of these equations because I can write them for all frequencies of interest and all types of responses. So now I'm looking at a system of equations written at each position in Fourier space. How large are these systems? They're small. Typical size of the, this system matrix um, has, um, there you go, the type times the, the frequency anywhere between, I would say, 50 and maybe 150 rows. How many columns? Number of depths, typically 5 to 10. These are, these are strongly overdetermined systems that you're solving. But these are very small systems of equations. They solve in less than milliseconds. Of course, we have to solve a lot of them because these are systems of equations that are solved at each point in Fourier space. So typically, we solve anywhere between 10,000 and 100,000 such systems of equations, but they are small. So we refer to this as the divide and conquer strength of the Fourier solution because in, to solve 100,000 small systems of equations is way faster than solving one very large system of equations, which is essentially what you would get in real space, where the rows of your system matrix would be 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. The columns would be 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. No way I can solve this in real time. So after I obtained the contrast in Fourier space, we do an inverse Fourier transform and we go back to real space to find our contrast. A little bit of an example here to show you how simulated kernels don't do a very good job. This is where we spend two weeks to simulate what the uh, incident field will be of each one of these six antennas in a realistic setup in FECO and it just took forever. Um, never mind, this is a typical uh, near field measurement. Notice the distances in millimeter between the antennas and these objects. This is actually a measurement. This is just a sketch. Um, and um, here are the estimated far zone distances for the antennas. And you can see that especially at 20 gigahertz, definitely our antennas are in the reactive near zone of these uh, waveguides. In fact, my student even used 3 gigahertz, uh, although he was fully aware that this is below the cutoff of these waveguides. And that is because the antennas are so close to these waveguides that there is reactive coupling, and you can see distance, especially in the reflection coefficient of the antenna. So this is the result when you use simulated kernels. Highly accurate convergent solution, but we just cannot model everything that goes in this chamber, and the result is not good. However, if you go and measure your, um, so let me see here. Essentially, when we were simulating these two field distributions, but when we go and measure the point spread function, now you can see some results with the resolution, which is pretty much within the expected resolution for the bandwidth of this signal. And there is an interesting example that I wanted to show you. One of my graduate students, Daniel Tajik, who is playing with holography for imaging of tissue, and. Um, we decided to look how, it will, uh, how we can measure a chicken wing here. And the problem with the chicken wing is that we had to put it in a uh, more or less matching medium. And we do have carbon rubber uh, tissue phantoms. But they are specifically made, custom made material to mimic the dielectric properties of um, scattered fibroglandular tissue in the human breast, and we have piles of them. So he decided to uh, put a petri dish inside a hole in, in such a medium and put the chicken wing here, and then came the question, I will be violating the Born limits if I have air in between 
that holder of carbon rubber and the uh, chicken wing, you can appreciate the difference between air and these complex permittivities of the tissue here, as well as the carbon rubber. So what he did, he played around with peanut butter and jam in a food processor. So finally, by adjusting the ratio of peanut butter and jam, he got a value of the permittivity, which was not that different from the carbon rubber, the black material here, uh, phantom material. And uh, he covered this on both sides with more carbon rubber sheets, and he imaged it. Uh, of course, you see here he has skin on the left. He indicated where the two little bones are in the chicken wing, and here you've got muscle. So here is a photo of how he obtained his point spread function by a calibration measurement in the chamber. And uh, here you see results. Notice that these are quantitative results. I failed to mention that if the point spread function is measured, then it scales correctly with the permittivity of your probe, which you know. And taking the scalar factor into account, your results that are coming out of holography are actually quantitative. Now, how accurate they are, that's a different story. But there is an estimate there, and you can see that actually, particularly the imaginary part, is uh, quite in a good agreement with what you see in this table here for the tissue properties in the peanut butter and jam. You also can see better in the imaginary part where there is loss. You can see better the, the bones inside the structure. But the real part shows better the skin and the muscle. So uh, you can certainly, despite the fact that you're violating with those objects the Bourne approximation, you can still obtain meaningful images that could be improved further on. Okay, let us now go into another type of real-time uh, imaging method, completely different type. It, is all, it belongs to the group of correlation methods. The big difference between methods like holography and the correlation methods is that holography solves a linear system of equations. Correlation methods don't. They just add up responses. There is no inversion in, uh, of a linear system of equations, and this is also done with radar or pulsed radar imaging, the delay in some methods. There is no linear system of equations solved. So these methods are very fast, but they underperform the linear system methods such as holography. And what I mean is that these qualitative imaging methods, such as radar imaging and sensitivity maps, uh, the correlation methods, uh, they're even faster than holography. While holography requires two to three to four seconds to produce an image, this is done in milliseconds. So um, what is the principle? There is a reconstruction formula for the sensitivity map that um, Maitin proposed some time ago, and I'm not going into the derivation of it. I'm giving the final result. This is your image. And you can see that the image is formed by summing over summing over summing. And what are you summing? You're summing here first the difference between the incident field and the total field measurement, which is what? It is your scattered field, essentially, in Born sense. And you're multiplying by the derivative of the incident field uh, S parameter with respect to the permittivity that is at the position that you want to image R prime. Now, this is known as a Fréchet derivative in the imaging community. And this one, in order to be computed, because it has to be computed, it is not measured, we need, again, the dot product of the incident fields of the two antennas. So originally, when we were proposing this method, we were using a very fast adjoint sensitivity formula to calculate this derivative using simulated incident fields. The physical meaning. Remember somebody, it, was it yesterday, was talking, what is an image? What, what is it showing? Yes, it is important to understand what an image is showing. So let me show you here. First of all, this derivative or sensitivity map is nothing but a 3D image of the Fréchet derivative of the L2 norm of the differences 
of all total and incident responses, if you wish the scattered view. But unlike in normal nonlinear inversion methods, notice that here it is assumed that it is the incident field that depends on the permittivity, not the other way around. Why? Because it is the incident field Jacobian that I can calculate in no time, and it is object independent. So this is a complex, by the way, result. The real part of the sensitivity map is essentially the derivative of this functional f with respect to the real permittivity, and it indicates where contrast exists in epsilon prime between your background and object under test. And that is because if you see here, this functional f, what this indicates is where you need to change epsilon prime in the background medium so that the background response becomes close to the measured response. So it is totally inverted compared to what is done in nonlinear imaging. So the sensitivity maps are essentially indicators of derivatives, of Fréchet derivatives, that's what they are only that the derivative is on the incident field, not on the total field. All right, so um, let us now look at uh, the possibility of getting rid of this simulated uh, Jacobian, which we spoke about right here. And we said, how about replacing that with a point spread function? And it certainly is doable, as is shown here. It's a very simple concept. Uh, derivative is approximated with finite differences. Uh, in order finite differences to apply, we need weak scattering. This is exactly what is happening when you're measuring uh, a probe, a scattering probe. So we do a measurement with the scattering probe, presumably at some location R prime, and then what we measure with the scattering probe, we can uh, use to calculate approximately the scattered field PSF. Of course, we measure the PSF only with the probe at the center, but again, in a uniform or uh, layered medium, um, you can use that result with translation of coordinates in order to obtain the PSF for any other position of the scattering probe with respect to the antennas. So uh, further on, my uh, PhD student, Dennis, Dennis Shumakov, he graduated, now he's working for the Government of Canada on metrology and standards. Um, so with him, we uh, proceeded to um, change this uh, situation and replace the Jacobian, computed Jacobian, with the measured PSF. And uh, Dennis called the resulting map a scattered power map. The name is fitting because indeed this result is a dot product of two scattering parameters. And if you know microwave engineering, that is proportional to the scattered power emanating at your scattering center R prime. So the scattered power map method is uh, properly named. Anyhow, so now our forward model can be cast in this form where we have again a, uh, this, this now looks like a cross correlation between the, not looks like it is a cross correlation between the um, measured responses with your object under test and the PSF. And of course, using existing cross correlation uh, uh, algorithms, 2D algorithms, this is practically an instantaneous generation of a 3D map which may have 10,000 to 100,000 voxels in it. Of course, the effort is shifted toward the system calibration, measuring the PSF or computing the Jacobian, although that is a pre-process. This is done before the um, measurements start. And here is a very idealized simulation example where you see the PS simulated PSF acquisition simulated data acquisition on an F-shaped object. Here I wanted to show you how a typical PSF looks like at four gigahertz, the magnitude distribution, of course, in the center, and you see the phase with, um, um, in, in degrees. So this is your typical result for the F-shape. You see we don't have much of a resolution in range. 
Uh, and also the images with cross-correlation methods are a little bit more blurred than what comes with linear inversion solvers. So this result is perfectly accept um, understandable. The um, sharpness of the image certainly can be improved if you keep increasing the number of responses. But of course, under experimental conditions, this is not very easily done. So further on, the basic contribution of my PhD student, Dennis, and uh, Sheng Tu with him as well, another PhD student who just graduated, is that uh, it took some theoretical work to actually prove that we can relate the scattered power map of the object under test, the qualitative image of the object under test, and the qualitative image of a scattering probe through this linear relationship. Now, this linear equation, so this is like a second processing step after the qualitative imaging. Now we are solving a linear system of equations. And this linear system of equations is obtained exactly the way we did with holography because we want real-time computation. Again, we see that along x and y, we've got a uh, x deconvolution uh, needed in x and y. This is a convolution operation here. Again, casting the problem in Fourier space and again solving a linear system of equation at each point in Fourier space. That one is even faster than holography because the number of the size of the system of equations is actually nz by nz, where nz is the number of um, range locations, this depth locations at which we want to image, and these are typically 5 to 10. We are talking about a system of equations of 10 by 10 equations. This is really nothing. This solves instantaneously. In, so it really doesn't matter that you have to solve 100,000 of those. And now the image becomes much better with just one additional processing step. You also get much better range resolution. Of course, this is simulated data, so it's nice, noise-free. So now if we go into measurements, the situation changes. Of course, uh, we can still image. You see again this tissue, uh, carbon rubber, phantom materials at different layers, different types of microwave uh, ceramic objects embedded. And uh, this is the um, calibration object, the scattering probe shown here. So as you can see, again, with exactly the same method, with uh, uh, born limitations broken all over, uh, you can still obtain uh, quite good images at different layers, particularly in the imaginary part, because we have large contrast in the losses in the imaginary part of the permittivity. These uh, tissue carbon rubber sheets are very lossy, tangent delta 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 whereas the microwave ceramic is practically loss-free. So no wonder we see better images of what is going on in uh, the imaginary part of the primitivity. So let us talk very quickly about radar measurements. Yep, and I will be wrapping up. Uh, I'm not going to even show examples for those because I want to emphasize that the radar imaging method known as delay and sum is essentially fundamentally, mathematically equivalent to the sensitivity map method that I showed you before. It is a typical correlation-based method. No linear systems of equations are solved. And how it works, the concept is really simple. Let me remind you that the forward model of scattering, scalar forward model of scattering in radars involves the convolution of the impulse responses However, instead of delving into that, of course, we can obtain those analytically, uh, and I'm going to show you our, an example later, but let us uh, directly jump into what the point spread function does. It can also be measured, and many of the radar people are doing concealed weapon detection do just that. They calibrate their, measure, their systems by measuring a metallic sphere at different distances from the radar to obtain a realistic point spread function. The point spread function is a reflection of what your kernel is. 
Now, you will measure with the sphere only at one distance. What do you do when the sphere is at a different distance from your bistatic radar setup? Well, all that you do really, assuming again uniform background, is that you will be properly delaying or advancing your point spread function depending on how the distance to the uh, two antennas changes. So, um, in uh, most far zone measurements, what are these PSFs? Delta functions. Nothing more than a delta function. All that it does is it shifts your response back and forth in time, mostly back. That's there by the name, delay and sum, because there is a sum um, a reference distance beyond which you can only, the, the displacement of the target from the center of the imaged volume uh, leads only to a delay in time. So. What is the principle of delay and sum and the cross-correlation imaging? Well, you will see that the cross-correlation starts with the computing of a quantity called the cross-correlation of the signal. The cross-correlation of the signal is exactly um, a reflection of what the forward model is. You are cross-correlating the point spread function, the response due to a point scatter, with your actual response. Knowing that cross-correlation is nothing but a measure of the similarity of two signals, X does exactly that. It measures the similarity between what is coming, uh, what is coming from your target with the um, measurement that you already know for the scattering probe. Now, um, why is this operation leading to an image which is proportional to the uh, contrast kappa? Well, it is because if you now plug in the equation, the forward model for S, what you will see is that kappa at a given position is actually multiplied by an autocorrelation term which dominates this integral right here. In other words, when the PSFs are exactly at the position of your scatter, you're going to get a huge coefficient here. But when the PSFs are um, pointed to a different point, our prime, prime, which has nothing to do with the, uh, the location of your scatter, then you're talking about a cross-correlation term, which is very small. So when you do this over many uh, responses, um, then these cross-correlation terms add incoherently, whereas the autocorrelation terms, which are always real positive, add uh, coherently. So it, that, that really is what is behind delay in sum. And um, um, this is a schematic that uh, you can see in every radar imaging book, uh, sort of, which is telling you that you have these steering filters. These steering filters are nothing but your PSF, shifted properly, focused on an voxel that you want to image. So say you want to image a voxel, voxel at R prime. You then, that is done by software, tune all of your steering filters to that particular voxel, delay and shift all your responses properly so that they correspond to scattering from this voxel, and then you sum them up. And that is exactly what is done here. This is just a windowing function to clean up garbage like uh, clutter, radar clutter from other objects. And then finally, what is your image? You just uh, integrate in time x squared, the energy of the, um, of the x function, the cross-correlation function. And that is what your image is. That is really a qualitative image. There is no way you can get uh, quantitative information with this sort of image. And this is just uh, um, a quick uh, illustration showing how these steering filters work. Here are two targets. Assume transmission happens, let's say, from the center of the array, and all other antennas receive. What are you going to receive? At each antenna, you are going to receive two pulses scattered, one coming from target one, the other one coming from target two. For example, if you are at an antenna which is very close to target one, this antenna is going to receive 
early in time the reflection from target one, but the reflection from target two will take some time. There it is. What do the steering filters do? What this, they, when you focus on the voxel with target one, it will align all these uh, responses in such a way that the reflection from target one will fall within the same time window. Then you sum up, and this is what you get, the squared quantity of those in time. But if you just sum up, that is what you're going to get. Look how it is enhanced. So x finally as a function of time is after summation is this. If you want to focus on the voxel of target two, again, all the steering filters will shift all these responses so that the reflection, if it exists, from this point is going to fall in right in my reference window. And when you sum up, you're going to get exactly in this same reference window the reflection from target two. What if you focus on a void voxel where there is no scattering happening? You take one and you will see that the after alignment with this voxel, really there is no alignment between these responses. So when you sum them up, this is what you get. So of course, these are uh, images. Now remember, you know the location associated with all this. So uh, when you plot the square of that energy versus time, then you get a high intensity bright spot where your scatter is. So anyway, um, I think hopefully I covered the um, most important topics of correlation-based imaging. Again, the take-home message is that correlation-based imaging is really very fast because it doesn't even solve a linear system of equations. It just sums coherently and hopes to get a bright spot where a scatter is. In contrast, holography and um, SPM, scattered power mapping methods, they solve linear systems of equations. And with uh, the properly uh, scaled point spread function, which is the measured point spread function, you may even get a decent quantitative estimation of your complex permittivity. So um, this subject is indeed extensive. And if we go into nonlinear imaging, it is uh, even larger subject, honestly. Uh, but uh, currently, a lot of engineers are needed um, in the design of the hardware, uh, antenna and RF engineers. Um, and this is where a lot of effort goes uh, in the industrial world. But in the research world, uh, we are focusing on proper calibration methods, such as what objects to measure to get PSF or to get to know our system prior deployment, so that's a big research area. And of course, the biggest research area is inversion methods, uh, especially in the industry is uh, interested in real-time fast inversion methods. Uh, so um, everything that, or most of the things that you saw in this presentation are actually already explained in uh, that book. And uh, here is what you can do with a plush toy in a microwave scanner. <laughs> showing that you can find the packet of sugar in the middle of it. And I don't know, but they did put something, my students, in the arm of the plush toy too. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm glad to answer any questions over lunch, maybe. Thank you. We actually have uh, time for one question. Okay. Yes, you can compute it. Um, you can compute it directly by simulating your measurement. It is processed, but uh, so why do you think, so why do you want to measure it? Is it more accurate or not? Yes, and it is more accurate because we've got modeling errors. And we've got modeling errors because, do you see this scanner here? I should blow it up. Um, there are so many things that go into a scanning equipment. You have plates absorbers and um, yes I have a yes let me let me tell you something this um, rubber materials that I showed you before 
the um, accuracy of the, the guaranteed accuracy of the permittivity, real and imaginary, of this material as it is coming from the manufacturer is plus minus 30%. So my permittivity could be 10, but it could also be 13. It could also be 7. They really don't know. So this, this is what you're dealing with in the real world. Parameters of, uh, you see all these uh, holders and plastic holders and screws and uh, the, the, we, you have in the mechanical scanning system, you have metallic railing, you have absorbers. Um, the fabric, the manufacturers have absorbed these, these little cone uh, pyramids there. They can't tell you what are the, they don't know what the, the complex uh, permittivity of those are. So we can have only a best guess, use absorbing boundary condition maybe. It's not good. The absorbing boundary condition is way better than these absorbers. So the modeling errors don't have anything to do with numerical accuracy. The simulators are just fine. And we do make sure that our mesh is refined and we have convergence of the results. What is really the problem is putting every screw in, in this model, um, taking into account temperature deviations, little displacements. These plates, you know, they sh they're supposed to be horizontal. After you put several phantoms on, on them, they tilt, the students don't notice. It's just a mess, experimental mess, right? Which is very difficult to model in a simulator. Yes. You don't. That is, that is the answer to the question. You cannot take those into account um, unless you're, like for example, with the tissue phantom. Um, let me go to uh, something that looks like a, a tissue phantom. Um, with holography, I had that, okay. So you hope that the antenna scan at um, one millimeter from the surface of the tissue phantom. Now, when you measure, for example, a breast phantom, a real breast phantom, you will be scanning again one millimeter from the surface. What you do is you, and, and then when you measure the point spread function, you use these carbon rubber tissue phantoms that look to the antennas very much like the actual breast tissue, averaged, and you put in the middle your um, scattering probe. So you only can hope that in this PSF measurement, the majority of the coupling effects are taken into account. If you, for example, are measuring dense breast tissue, and you have actually dense fibroglandular tissue only five millimeters, from or seven millimeters from your antennas, then yes, you are not taking into account the interaction between the antenna and this fibroglandular tissue because this fibroglandular tissue is not the same as this carbon rubber sheet. It's close, but it is not the same. That is true. But not, but not with the newest ones. For the, the, the hemispherical ones, they don't care about the skin effect because their antennas are also just one millimeter from the skin. And they have coupling gel. Sometimes they actually use ultrasound gel, like um, in Bristol. They use just a layer of ultrasound gel between the antennas and the skin. So they, 
eliminate the problem of skin reflection by placing the antennas right on top of the tissue. Yeah. I did. Yeah. We can discuss this over lunch. Yes. Yes.